You're welcome back and thank you for your patience. Uh, we're going to, we are now joined by Mark Amaza, Senior Communications Officer, Yaga Africa, to be looking at the off-season elections. Uh, remember that yesterday or so, uh, the stakeholders signed a peace accord. Uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's a normal thing nowadays that uh, peace accords are being signed. And what are we looking at um, for Kogi, uh, Bayelsa and Imo State? Now, what are the lessons, uh, most importantly, uh, are we taking to this off-season election? Uh, those are the things that we intend to discuss right now with uh, our guest. Good morning and welcome to the program, Mark. Good morning. Okay, we understand that the peace accord was signed, but even then, there are some governors that did not attend the event and all that. We, uh, did you have more information about what really went down? Uh, no, we do not have more information. That's what's already out there in the public domain regarding their attendance and those who didn't make it. Um, but then it's important to to say it, it, the peace accord, which has become has be, is becoming a a tradition preceding election, depends a lot more on uh, a gentleman agreement and the willingness to follow it. It's not legally enforceable, uh, and and that's perhaps the reason why some candidates choose to go for the signings and others um, decide not to. But in your experience, do you think it has made any significant impact since uh, this peace accord, uh, they began to sign this peace accord before elections? It's very uh, hard to say if it has made any impact. Uh, we can't say why there was, uh, because in many cases there's still violence in, in many elections. Um, and, it, and so where there's no violence, we can't attribute the entirety to the peace accord. But I think importantly, is it's, it says a lot about our political culture and the behavior of our politicians, where we approach elections as though it were a war and, um, you know, a win at all cost attitude. And that behavior is one of the reasons why we see things like, you know, efforts like peace accords being made to um, get them to behave properly to ensure that they and their supporters obey the uh, law and order and don't cause disruptions. We also see a lot about how we enforce our laws in terms of prosecuting those who engage in political violence, those who also benefit from political violence. Because oftentimes, someone who is um, engaging in political violence may not even be the one directly benefiting. The candidates that benefit from this sort of violence, there's no punitive measures being meted out to them. And it only reinforces bad behavior. Mm -hmm. Okay, but um, especially this Kogi, Bayelsa, and Imo state are uh, said to be very volatile states. Maybe that's even one of the reasons why we even have uh, off-season elections in those states. Um, what? How would you assess the... Well, you are not a security expert, but I can just ask you. The level of preparedness... Okay, let's leave the security aspect. The level of preparedness uh, by all the relevant stakeholders, uh, including... Uh, Yaga Africa. So I can speak to the security aspect for at least one state, Imo state, where we, re where we are observing the elections and we recently released a report about the preparation, preparations for the elections. Um, for a long, for months, perhaps even a couple of years before the election, there's this climate of insecurity in the state. Um, so, and that is you no know, feeding into or shaping up the elections or how citizens are approaching the elections. Um, so one of the things we keep, of course, we hear all the time, uh, security agencies, particularly the police, which is the lead security agency around elections, talk about the preparedness they have um, regarding the elections. Um, we hope that considering the fact that it's just relatively, I see it's what just relatively, three states um, rather than 36, it will be easier for the police to ensure that law and order is uh, maintained for these elections. Regarding preparing preparations, well, we 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 um, have seen efforts by INEC to ensure that logistics are in place. But I think in the end, it will be what we see on elections day that will be the final determinant of how um, of of how prepared they were for the elections. Again, being optimistic that this logistics will not be a problem is a perennial headache for INEC uh, and for voters. But with sweet but they are often better when they are off cycle elections because it's easier to manage for a state of two than manage for the whole country. So we are looking at all of this, we are observing the preparedness and, and hoping that at this time all the stakeholders, issues around especially around logistics, the deployment of materials, um, security are being um, 
are implemented well or perfectly so that voters are encouraged to come out and vote and knowing that the elections will go smoothly. Well, from the international observers and also Yaga Africa that has been uh, observing elections and trying their best to make it more transparent, it was that uh, INET needed to do a little bit more uh, to, you know, uh, restore the confidence of the people in the elector elect electioneering process and all that. Now, INEC has just come out to say that transmission, electronic transmission of uh, results or collation of results is illegal. Now, that puts a question mark. Uh, we also heard uh, from one um, analysis that the people that might be coming out to do to actually vote on election day might be just as slow as 30% of the population that will come out in these states to vote. Uh, is that a true assessment? And what do you think about the statement of INEC that electronic uh, collation is illegal? First, I think I disagree that electronic transmission of results is illegal. It is not mandatory, but it's legal. Because this was a, um, a battle that we fought together with INEC to ensure that the Electoral Act 2022 included that clause that allows INEC to transmit election results. It doesn't mandate them. And that is a gap that we hope that in the next set of electoral reforms is fixed. Um, and because that gap, we saw INEC um, take advantage of that gap um, to not transmit results around elections, especially like presidential elections um, in, in, earlier in the year. And that really dealt a blow of confidence to voters because we have had from INEC multiple times in their own guidelines and various fora, INEC officials from the chairman say we are going to transmit election results. And Nigerian voters went to the polls without hope and that confidence that this time we are all going to be partaking in this coalition effort. Um, because look, we understand that the IREV, the INEC Reserve Viewing Portal, is not a coalition platform, but it's a platform that is intended to increase the confidence of citizens and voters by seeing these election results coming from each polling unit. So, unfortunately, the Supreme Court has ruled that, yes, it is not mandatory, um, but then it doesn't mean that it's illegal. Now, we hope we, regarding um, our voter turnout, voter turnout may be that low. It may be that low. We've, this is a problem we've dealt with over and over in every election. Um, since we started following um, voter turnout from 2011, it has been declining. At the general election, we had a 26% voter turnout. Last 2019, it was 34%. For off-cycle elections in Anambra in 2021, it was as low as 10%. We are hoping that it is higher, but again, as how high it will be, it's, there's a question. Um, but we, can, we have seen there's this diminished citizen trust and confidence in the electoral process. And coupled with, you know, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a hostile climate around uh, with rhetoric by politicians and behavior around violence, it's very likely going to put off, put off voters. Mm. Okay, so uh, let's just, uh, by way of emphasis, uh, go back to the uh, elections held earlier this year. What are some of the lessons that Yaga Africa especially learned? Because you went into the field very confident that you were going to do something and Nigerians will be the better for it. There's going to be transparency and all that. And then we saw what we saw. What are these lessons that you learned from the earlier elections that you're taking to the off-season election to make things better? And so just to clarify, is it lessons for Yaga Africa or is it lessons for uh, all election stakeholders? Well, both of them because you were standing in the gap. Uh, what Yaga Africa is doing was not being done in the electoral process in Nigeria until you showed up. So what are the things that you're going to do as Yaga Africa that will affect, let's start with Yaga Africa, that will affect the election or will make the elections more transparent or better uh, transmitted to the people? Well, for one, we are still deploying our election observers. Like I mentioned, we are deploying observers in Bial, in Imo, and Kogi, deploying our methodology, our process and results verification for transparency methodology that looks at the election process on um, election day and able to make projections on you know, voter turnout and vote for each party. And that is a very powerful tool in terms of, it, in terms of verifying um, the credibility of elections. In the last election, we first broke the news around um, the fact that the official results from River State and what we expected from our um, from our own projections did not tally. 
and that was you know, corroborated by a report on, uh, by BBC, which looked at results that was on the INEX results via portal to see and noted the same thing. So that we're still going to do that. I'm still going to make our observations um, and I make them public prior to the elections, during the elections, and after the elections. For for the general uh, for INEC, which is the main elect as electoral management body, the first lesson has always been around logistics, ensuring that logistics gets to each polling unit as it when due, that polls open on time, and that all voters to, so that people who want to vote are able to vote, um, you know, um, in the in the hours of voting. But also very very importantly is the work that they need to do to restore our confidence, like we mentioned earlier, keeping to their word. Um, we mentioned earlier around election, electronic transmission of results, which INEC itself put in its guidelines, they arrive from the Electoral Act and then to turn around and not do it. And that those kind of actions diminish trust. So there's a need for INEC to begin to restore trust by doing what they say they will do um, in terms of keeping their word when they say they're going to transmit results, they ought to do that. Yeah, well, but your role was supposed to make them sit up and do what they're supposed to do. But it seems as if it didn't really work in the last election because, well, as some people will put it, they still had their way. They did what they wanted to do. Yes. So what significant yes. impact is what you do going to have or has it been having on the electoral process? So we, we did call INEC out on that failure to transmit results, calling out many, many times on different fora, um, different platforms, um, in, you know, even in conversations with them. Unfortunately, because the law does not mandate INEC to transmit results, and that, ha that has been made clear by the Supreme Court's ruling on the election petitions, that has become uh, a defense that INEC uses. And this is why we say we realize that gap in the law, and one of the things we hope we push for in the amendment to the Electoral Act will be that that gap is closed. And we see even the Senate itself um, made that confirmation, it's made that call saying that transmission results should be made mandatory. So we're still going to be holding INEC accountable, uh, calling them out when they need to be called out, where we see that there's a failure on their part to do the right things. We'll still make it clear, uh, make it known, and, and we'll still see where there is a, if it's a gap that needs a legal amendment or no around policy, we'll still push for that to be done. How many of these gaps do you see? It's just uh, that they're not mandated to transmit electronically, or are there some other things that you think should go into the Electoral Act that were not or were missed uh, at the last amendment? So beyond just the Electoral Act, some of the gaps are also constitutional. So for example, around the appointment of, INEC, of officials into INEC, um, the, we, there's a call, this is a call that's been made as far back as 2008 by the Justice Muhammad the Wise Committee on Electoral Reforms, that the president should not be the one appointing the INEC chairman or chairperson or its commissioners um, at the national level or the state level. And this has even been made clearer recently with the, with the, with, with, with the appointment of, of new electoral, um, resident electoral commissioners, of which at least three have been openly partisan in the recent past, as we said, the last elections, um, which you know, we saw how the Senate speedily confirmed them, um, you know, did not pay heed to petitions by citizens. Those and that those are a are a huge red flag for our democracy when we begin to appoint such um, partisan officials uh, but into the election management body. So those are kind of um, gaps we should see. This is not just a new thing because when commissioners were appointed last year, when we did last year, we also raised red flags around some of them regarding their partisan um, their their past. We raised red flags and those were ignored. And those also played out in the elections when we see, for example, recent electoral commissioner in Sokoto State, uh, who was suspended by INEC, or uh, and the one in Adama State who unlawfully declared a winner when it was supposed to be the, the role of the returning officer. And, and you know, that's a matter that is that's still being contended in court. Those were red flags we raised. You know, we also raised those red flags in our election manipulation risk index, which we list in February. Uh, January and February around the risk around the election. And one of some of the risks we identified were I, was INEC capture in some states. And all of this played out. So it's very, very important that these gaps are filled. We need to take that power away from the president because the president is an interested party. Whether he's contesting or not, his party, I mean, he's a politician, his party was an interested party in the elections. So there is a need for independent bodies to appoint officials to the election management body and not 
a interested party in that election or in elections that that body will conduct. So how far are you on that? Um, how far in the level of engagement and everything that needs to bring that about? Are you waiting for this election to be over or you're waiting for next year or you have already started the process? And if you have, how far so far? We've already started the process of the engagement, say engaging with the National Assembly, the committees around electoral reform at the Senate and the House of Representatives. We already begin to come uh, have conversation with other electoral stakeholders, including INEC and INEC security agencies. And these conversations will continue. We're not going to wait until um, 2025, 2026 before this is um, are done. We want them to be done as quickly as possible. Uh, we have let lessons um, from the previous election amendments, um, even though that wasn't for a lack of starting early. But we also want that those amendments be done as quickly as possible so that they are operationalized um, and uh, you know, tested, because we're going to have more off-cycle elections before 2027 elections. We have two governorship elections next year. We have more in 2025. All till 2027, there'll be off-cycle elections, not just governorship, but also legislative elections. So it's important that we get these amendments done quickly and that these, um, these laws are tested in the various elections leading up to the general elections that, we off that are the ultimate test. Mm. So are we expecting something new from Yaga Africa? Uh, well, what in one this election, in, you know, yeah. in this election, no, it's still going to be our election observation, um, which we are going to, like I said earlier, we are deploying observers. We are deploying um, 659 observers across the three states um, to observe the election, and then we'll be providing our election the updates and reports at the end of the elections. Um, so those are what we're going to be expecting from Yaga Africa. Okay, so what, what, what we kind of, uh, some people kind of rely on Yaga Africa and bodies like yours to get uh, the relevant information during and after the election and all that. Um, when you do these things to make sure that you put uh, IDEC on their toes and you inform the people clearly what is going on, and let's say INEC just uh, does what they like, do you ever try or think about um, legal uh, ways to bring INEC to to do what they're supposed to do? Or you just observe and go, whatever well, they do, they, they go they get away with it. So one thing about observer groups such as Yaga Africa is that we don't just observe and go. We also make effort to see that our recommendations are implemented. Um, so that's why a lot of the um, ideas are feeding to the next um, election advocacy or reforms advocacy we're going to do a step from the rep our own report and report of partner organizations um, that you know, also observe, observe the elections. We're not just observing, issuing a report, and leaving. And where we see that there's a gap, where that's the failure um, on INEC or any other um, institution was a, was a departure from what the law prescribes, of course, we'll be exploring legal avenues to ensure that they do the right, right thing. Okay. Are there particular things in these three states that you would like to observe? You know, like what do you think will go down in Imo or in Bayelsa or in Kogi State in your uh, experience? So, the not particular particular things we always observe uh, is, is voter turnouts, uh, the process, you no, know, the process of the elections, um, the turnouts, the looking at how. All the parties, um, where the political candidates, INEC, security agencies, um, how they all conduct themselves and behave, looking at the collation process, because that's very, very important, and looking at the final, the results, um, final results. That's why it's a process and results verification methodology. It's not just looking at the results, the process is as important as the results. So, all of this, we're also looking at the turnout of things like young people, turnout of, of, of women, turnout of persons with disability. These are critical groups that we always um, look to see how we can have, you know, push for more inclusion um, for them in the, in the political process. Yeah, and um, in Imo State, we have uh, uh, somebody who is uh, quite close to the people living with disabilities in one of these parties contesting. Uh, maybe that will give them a sense of belonging as well. But uh, while you do your work, and I'm using your organization not because it's the only organization, but we're talking to you right now. Uh, your experiences might be the same as other organizations, other CSOs that uh, are trying to uh, do this as, as advocacy for our electoral process to be better and all that. Uh, what do you think the people themselves need to do that they have not been doing 
uh, to contribute also to the transparency of this election. It cannot be only Yaga Africa. It cannot be only Serap. It cannot be only the CSOs that we, we think about. Uh, so what are the people missing? What should they be doing? What should their role be? Uh, going forward, as you fight your fight on one side, what should the people be fighting? I think an important thing that students should be fighting is to not um, distance themselves away from the process because it was unsatisfactory the previous time. Um, that's the mistake we often make where we feel like the elections did not go well or as well as we hoped, or even worse, that our, our preferred candidate did not win and that we now decide that we are better off not involving ourselves. We need to get in, we need to involve ourselves. Um, the elections will only get better if we all participate. The more we step away from it, it will only get worse. So that's very, very important. So very, very important for students to understand that there's a lot of power that they have, especially in numbers, in terms of ensuring that the right things are done. Um, there's a demanding for things, um, for, the, for laws to be done, to be followed, for um, the necessary reforms to be done. All of these are very, very important. So we need more citizen participation um, and not to not apathy. And of course, if you're in any of these three states, just to go out and vote, um, irrespective of how you feel around, uh, because this is one the power you have as a citizen to choose your leadership is a power that should not be taken for granted. Mm -hmm. So you should get out there, go out there and vote if you're in any of these three states and you're a research voter. It needs more citizen participation. Our democracy needs that more than ever now. Okay, you've just spoken to the people, now talk to the umpire, the political umpire, Eidek, and maybe the, the security personnel that are going to ensure that there's peace within the domains that the elections will be held. As we wrap up. Well, all right. Well, you want me to, I, I didn't get your question. Can you come again? Speak to Eidek. You have talk, talked to the people. Speak to Eidek and every other... Um, person or agency that is going to make sure we have a peaceful election on Saturday? Well, of course, for INEC, the most important thing they should, they should know is, is this is a very critical time for them. Um, it's considering that there's a low, is a diminished trust in, in our elections, um, the tiny voter turnout. These are things that should worry them and should make them you know, um, want to do, uh, ensure that their actions begin to uh, make a turnaround in how we view elections in this country. That's very, very important, very critical for them. As far as security agencies, it's very important that they remain nonpartisan and ensure that the law is law and order is maintained. And also, most importantly, that there should be no sacred cows around those for those who break the law, whether they are candidates, you know, people high up, or um, those or, the, or their supporters. It's very, very important that there's no no one is spared in terms of in, in, when they break the law, because. If we don't do that, we'll only be reinforcing bad behavior, like I said earlier, where it is becomes part of our political culture acceptable to engage in violence, whether it's actual violence or even violent rhetoric um, ahead of elections. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Mark Amaza, for coming on the show and sharing your thoughts. We wish you well uh, in Kogi by Elsa. Thank you for having me. State here. Thank you for coming. So we've been talking with Mr. Mark Amaza, Senior Communications Officer, IAGA Africa, on the preparedness of the relevant agencies for the election, the off-season election holding in Imo, Bayelsa, and Kogi states. Uh, but also we were looking at the peace accord that was being signed. How is it going to have an impact on this election and the role of the individuals and all the relevant agencies? That's how we're going to draw the curtain on the show this morning. We are so happy that you were able to stay with us and uh, continue to the end. At this point, we'd like to say thank you to you on behalf of uh, the entire team of The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Let's do it again tomorrow. My name is Nyam Gul Agaji.